If you have followed the scintillating unfolding of Operation Sindur, you must have heard a great deal about the drones used in the military standoff between India and Pakistan, which saw tensions rising in an unprecedented manner. India's strong and fitting response to the Pakistani side had many a star performers when it came to the weapons, and drones, of course, are one of those. So the effectiveness of the Indian air attack and air defense was bolstered by the use of loitering munitions or kamikaze drones that have both surveillance and strike capabilities. Likewise, Pakistani side also used a combination of Turkish, Chinese and their indigenously developed drones against India. So what I'll do today is that I am going to give you a quick description of the use of drones in modern wars across some theaters that includes ours. But first, what is the strategic overview of this wonder weapon of the modern warfare? Let's declutter the nomenclature first. You know, the term drone is broadly used to refer to various types of unmanned systems, such as the unmanned aerial systems, the UAS, the unmanned aerial vehicles or the UAVs, and remotely piloted aircrafts or the RPAs. These platforms vary significantly in capability with the payload capacities ranging from 5 kg to over 500 kgs, and also in their roles from reconnaissance to surveillance to fatal attacks, etc. Now, they have proven their impressive capabilities in the entire spectrum of the ISTAR, intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance, as well as armed ISTAR missions. Sounds complicated. Let me help you break it down a bit. You know, modern military drones are capable of performing a complete range of any combat functions. And these combat functions can be summarized in five stages. Search, seek, identify, track, and destroy. So what is meant by search is locating potential targets or threats. C means gathering visual or sensor-based information. Identify means confirming the nature of the target. Track means monitoring target movement in real time. And finally, destroy, which means engaging and neutralizing the target. And before we go deeper, please understand some historical context as well. You know, drones are not a recent innovation. Their military application dates back to World War I with early experiments by the British. The interwar period and post-World War II period saw the Americans advance this technology significantly. In recent years, however, drone warfare has undergone a dramatic transformation. Let's now come directly to modern conflicts where Turkey, although a late entrant into the drone market, has emerged as a frontline drone super factory. And this has become a challenge to India as it sided against India with Pakistan in Operation Sindur. But first, where the Turkish drones caught world attention the first time was in the 2020 war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. That was where the Bayraktar TB2 drones played a pivotal role. And this reset the role of air power in modern conflict and specifically whether cheap, attributable platforms could have game-changing effects on the battlefield. So the Bayraktar TB2 drone is roughly equivalent to the American-made MQ-1B, the main unmanned aerial vehicle in the US's two-decade-long war on terrorism. Moreover, the TB2 is effective at striking targets in areas with a small number of air defenses and for spotting targets for artillery and standoff strikes from manned fighters. So after giving a decisive victory to Azerbaijan, the next spotlight fell on Bayraktar's in the Russia-Ukraine war two years later, which means when it started in February 2022. As for Russia, they have also used systems like the Shahid 136 from Iran, the Lancet and many, many others. And they have proved to be equally effective in evolving their drone capabilities. But let's for now discuss the Ukrainian side because we want to understand why the TB2s have been so effective. So Kyiv has relied on the Bayraktar TB2 and a variety of first-person view, which is the FPV drones, that they have constantly evolved. Then there are Magura V-5 naval drones downing the famous Russian warship Moskva, drones like Baba Yaga, and also the AI-powered drones where Ukraine has become the first country in the world to successfully use AI-enabled drones in a war of attrition. In fact, the Ukraine war has shown that naval kamikaze drones can neutralize advanced assets such as Sukhoi 30s very recently. And this highlights the disruptive potential of unmanned systems in maritime warfare as well. 
But let's now circle back to the TB2. What makes it special is not only the survivability, but also its low cost replacement. The war in Ukraine has shown that TB2 operators can absorb high rates of attrition, but they can also quickly replenish stockpiles of the drone to keep the aircraft in the air. Now, these aircraft were then used to augment Ukrainian capabilities for certain missions and continued to pressure Russian forces without really risking the lives of very few Ukrainian pilots. So the drone's commercial components and low cost of production makes this possible. The point is, the TB2 is so inexpensive that an operator can suffer high rates of drone attrition and still keep on fighting with models that roll off the assembly lines very, very quickly. Going further in the Russia-Ukraine war, both sides have also used the cheap first-person view drones, uh, like I told you a little while ago, which are now well known for zooming over the battlefield and capturing footage routinely shared online by both Russian and Ukrainian sources. Then there are the sea drones that Ukraine has used with great effectiveness and that I just told you about, about downing a Sukhoi 30 from the sea. Now, the thing is that we would need another show for covering the Russia-Ukraine drone theater fully. I will cut it short for now to bring you to the India-Pakistan theater as Operation Sindhur unfolded. Now, coming to India first, India primarily imports its drones from two key players, Israel and the United States. And these systems uh, include, from Israel, we import Heron and IAI Searcher that are reconnaissance UAVs, as well as Harrop and Harpy, which are loitering munitions for precision strikes. And then we get the MQ-9B Predator, the recently acquired uh, drones from US for naval surveillance. But then also remember that India has been evolving an indigenous ecosystem where DRDO's research and development on drones began in the 1990s. But service specific requirements could not be met and hence that kind of delayed that deployment. But still we have key indigenous drones. The most well known here is the Nagastra 1, which is an indigenously developed loitering munition, uh, also called the suicide drone, which was effectively deployed against Pakistan during Operation Sindhur. And what makes this mention really special is that this was Nagastra's debut at a battlefield environment. Needless to say, this will go a long way in achieving better self-reliance in our drone ecosystem. Apart from above, we have been developing the Rustam 2, which is a medium altitude, uh, long endurance uh, you know, drone and the Archer NG, etc., which is armed uh, drone, etc. But then there are also private sector and startups now that are actively involved in drone production, contributing to cost effective and innovative solutions. In fact, the Nagastra drone has been developed by Nagpur based solar industries. But then let's also understand what is the drone ecosystem in Pakistan. Now, in Pakistan, they usually operate a mix of Turkish, Chinese and indigenously developed drones. Let's start with the Turkish ones. Of course, the most commonly used ones are called the Bayraktar TB2 drones that have already uh, proved their battle readiness and effectiveness in the Russia-Ukraine theater. But then that's not the only version of the Bayraktar drones. Pakistan also uses Bayraktar Akinsi drones. Now, since I've already told you about the TB2s, let me now spend a little time with the Akinsis. You know, Akinsi is a high altitude long endurance UCAV that is much more capable than its TB2 predecessor. Akinsi drone is wider and longer than the Bayraktar TB2 with a 20 meter long wingspan. This UCAV is also equipped with a triple redundant flight control system and its dual artificial uh, intelligence powered avionics suit improves the drone situational awareness and signal processing. The drone is controlled by homegrown satellites that allow a pilot and a commander uh, operator to control the aircraft. Additionally, the drone is capable of carrying a maximum payload of 1,350 kilograms and can be fitted with various weapon uh, payloads, including missiles, long range standoff weapons and laser guided smart ammunition. Now, let me come to another Turkish drone that caught Indian headlines. These are the Songar drones. Now, Songars are Turkey's armed multi-role UAVs designed for coordinated stealthy operations. If you remember, on the night of May 8th, Indian forces witnessed unprecedented drone intrusions across the northern and western frontiers, with over 300 
to 400 unmanned aerial vehicles attempting to cross into Indian territory at about 36 different locations, ranging from Leh in the north to Sir Creek in the west. And if you remember, Indian authorities have confirmed that the drones used were primarily the Songar armed drone systems from Turkey manufactured by the Turkish defense firm Asasgard. Now, what is important to note here is that the Indian side said clearly the possible purpose of these large scale aerial intrusions were to test Indian air defenses as well as to gather intelligence. And this was a point which was noted uh, by the Indian strategic community as well. And of course, India retaliated with our own drones that damaged a Pakistani AD radar. But Turkish drones are not the only drone Pakistan is using. There are also Chinese UAVs. Let's see what is the main drone there. When it comes to China, there is the CH series or the Chang Hong series, which is a medium altitude long endurance drone. And by some accounts, it claims that this is also fit for high altitude flying, making it a hail as well. And this uh, drone is made by the Chinese state owned aircraft manufacturer. Now, in terms of comparison, the CH-4 closely resembles the US MQ-9 Reaper drone. The CH series drones have been the most exported Chinese drones in the last few years and have been exported to many countries in Africa, Middle East, South and Southeast Asia and of course Pakistan. Also remember that the CH-4 is the most popular of the CH series so far. But after this, the Pakistanis also have their indigenous development, which are known as the Shahapar series. Now, these are indigenous tactical UAVs where they have now developed Shahapar 2 and Shahapar 3 series as well. And apart from all this, Pakistan has began its domestic drone production in 2009 with Burak UAVs, which is a jointly developed venture with China. Now, let's circle back to some key takeaways for India in terms of current needs and capabilities. You know, India's drone capabilities are evolving to meet modern battlefield and surveillance needs. And these needs can be uh, classified in primarily two uh, actions. One is reconnaissance, which means short term focused intelligence gathering. And the other is surveillance, which means long term broad spectrum observation. The thing with surveillance is that while satellites provide wide coverage, they are constrained by orbit time. Therefore, Continuous minute-to-minute -minute monitoring requires a combination of manned and unmanned assets. And India is also developing what is known as the stratospheric unmanned platforms currently under de uh, being developed by the DRTO. And this may bridge this gap, which means, you know, and um, round the clock uh, surveillance. And if I may give you a rough comparison, do you remember the Chinese spy balloon? It was something similar. So on the Indian side, we are focusing on developing drones based on operational role, which I already told you, you know, search, see, identify, track, destroy. So all these operational roles, we are also trying to make it as cost efficient as possible, because the key takeaway is that that's what made the FPVs and the TB2 so effective in battlefields. Then we are trying to have uh, as much ranges as possible in our drone manufacturing and development. And finally, we are also trying to develop different control systems, which means that it could be manned hybrid as well as autonomous. And just as drone capabilities are rising, counter drone capabilities are also developing. And this is the other half of the story. Now, you may have heard of our layered air defenses where S-400 is the outermost layer for taking down high moving missiles and jets. But then there's also Akash, which is more effective against other attacks. And then we have a variety of anti-aircraft systems such as the Zu 23 mm cannons and the Shilka systems. Shilkas, in fact, have been used for taking down drones as well. And then the much talked about L-70 anti-aircraft guns that have been very effective too, especially in operations in Dur. And finally, we have the DRDO's D-4 system. The D-4 stands for Drone Detect, Deter and Destroy to provide a 360 degree static defense, which has been developed to integrate with our overall AD capabilities. In fact, they also proved effective against Pakistan's drone attacks. Now, finally, the last leg of this discussion has to be about policy and future development. To boost the domestic drone ecosystem, the government has some plans. There is some what is called the Drone Rules 2021, which is a simplified regulatory framework for development and deployment. 
Then we have the Drone Shakti mission in 2022 to encourage public-private partnerships and startup involvement. And by mid-2024 itself, India had inducted approximately 2,000 to 2,500 drones with spending between uh, you know, $400 million to $420 million. And after Operation Sindur specifically, one can expect a monumental shift in the production and acquisition of drones from across the board. Additional support can come from defense industry corridors, more support for indigenous underwater drone development and for joint ventures with foreign tech providers. Because what we have to really keep in mind is China's drone edge. China leads in innovation. It has cutting edge systems like the Fei Yi, which is a dual purpose drone, which can be launched from both air and sea as well as from a submarine, showing a high degree of integration between platforms. Similarly, now we know that for making matters more complicated, uh, Pakistan has Turkish drone capabilities that are fast evolving and unambiguously supporting Pakistan against India. I'll be back to discuss more on the topic. Stay tuned.